Alright everybody, welcome back to another video. Have you ever gotten to this point in the year and realized that you wanted to brew a pumpkin ale? Well, so have I. So, watch on and uh, let's brew a pumpkin ale together. Hey, so if it's your first time here, I just want to welcome you to the channel. Uh, so this channel is all about making grain to glass videos. And what that means is taking uh, a beer all the way from the recipe stage through the brew and into the actual tasting stage all in one video. So you get to see everything and every step of the process all in one single video. And you get to go back and critique ideas that uh, or decisions that I might have made in the past and see how they impacted the final beer. Uh, so that is all provided here for your reference. The recipes for all of my beers are included in every single video description. So if you do happen to see one that you might like to brew, uh, go ahead and check out the description box and there will be a recipe there for you. While you're hanging out in that section of the page, please like this video. So anyway, what are we doing today? We are making an Imperial Pumpkin Brown Ale. So my beer of choice for the fall is actually an Oktoberfest like this one. Um, I made this beer a couple weeks ago and it has gotten better and better and I really enjoy it for fall weather. However, there's just a part of me that still wants to make a pumpkin beer. Um, <laughs> it's not really my beer of choice, but I think it's high time that I made one. And uh, so I got to thinking about how I would do that. Now, there's several different ways you can go about making a pumpkin ale. You can make a light-bodied one, you can make a heavy-bodied one, you can make one that's just spices and no pumpkin, so you can actually you know, get the same flavors through the pumpkin spices by themselves. Or you can go all pumpkin and light on spice. You can make it an amber ale, you can make it a lager like this, you could make it as a, a stout or a porter. Um, but I'm choosing to make it as a brown ale, but not just any brown ale, an imperial brown ale, which isn't really a thing. Um, doesn't really have its own category. Uh, an Imperial Brown Ale is basically just a strong brown ale. So I figured I would just use this as an opportunity to just take a step outside of the conventional style guidelines that I'm always operating within. Uh, so we're going to go for a beer that I think would fit very, very well with the idea of pumpkin pie and or pumpkin spice. Uh, so an Imperial Brown Ale should, if I do this correctly, taste very, very rich and malty and full of flavor, but with no roast. It's gonna occupy that middle ground somewhere between a porter and an amber ale, but strong, all right, seven and a half, eight percent. So this type of beer should be able to provide a phenomenal amount of flavor, a lot of biscuity, bready, um, you know, kind of doughy malt flavor, uh, as well as a little touch of caramel in addition to having a decently high finishing gravity to add sweetness to back up that pumpkin and the pumpkin spice. Uh, and I'm hoping that in a 7.5% to 8.5% ABV package, this beer is something that is very enjoyable on increasingly colder fall evenings. Um, and maybe it will even make its way all the way to the Christmas season, depending on how long I choose to age it. I built this recipe basically out of a amalgamation of different brown ale recipes as well as just some of my personal touches. Uh, so I'm really interested to see what it does. On a second note, using pumpkin in beer is uh, actually something that is warranted discussion. Uh, so pumpkin itself is actually not necessarily something that you're going to get a lot of converted sugars out of if you mash it. Um, and it's really not something you're going to get that much flavor out of. Uh, so oftentimes it is skipped in these recipes and you just add the pumpkin spice, which is basically what people taste when they think of pumpkin pie. It's basically just the combination of cinnamon, nutmeg, allspice, cloves, and uh, ginger. And uh, that's basically what your brain perceives as pumpkin pie spice. But pumpkin itself has been proven time and time again to not really have any sort of uh, specific gravity potential. In fact, I Based on all the research that I did, I put in uh, pumpkin as a new ingredient into Beersmith with a specific gravity potential of 1.003, uh, which is basically next to nothing. So when we add our pumpkin in, we're getting a little bit of flavor out of it, we're getting a decent amount of body out of it, and we're getting a little bit of a, uh, a nice kind of squashy note, I guess. Um, you will be able to taste it. I don't think it's really gonna be super critical towards the overall success of the beer. Um, that, that being said, you can either use canned pumpkin or you can use the actual gourd, uh, cut it up and, you know, roast it, do what you will with it. And in my case, I am using canned pumpkin because I am just simply too lazy to go get actual pumpkins. Canned pumpkin is kind of the way to go. I want to make sure you have no preservatives in that, no additional uh, sugars added as well, just pure, plain, blended, ground up pumpkin, whatever that paste-like thing is. Um, that's what you want. 
If you don't have pumpkin available to you though, you can use butternut squash because guess what? It tastes exactly the same. Anyway, uh, there's not too much else to be said about this. I think we're gonna go ahead and get into the recipe. All right, so it's a pretty large grain bill because I'm expecting my mash efficiency to uh, drop significantly. So uh, you may have to tailor this to your own system. <clears throat> so I am using 12 pounds of Maris Otter as a base malt, which should give us a nice bready base. I'm adding two and a half pounds of Munich to that. Munich malt is gonna increase the breadiness as well as add some bread crusty tones and a little bit of doughiness, I guess. Um, to that, I'm adding a pound and a half of brown malt, which should be nice, dry, and nutty. Uh, and a kiss of roast on top of that. One pound of biscuit malt for additional biscuit flavor, um, and then half a pound of Munich to add some nice caramel and chocolate uh, deep, rich notes. Um, and then a quarter pound of Carafa 2, which has been debittered. Uh, and that is for color and additionally just to kind of make the beer a little bit more complex in terms of the almost roasted character. We don't really want actual roast in this because then it's going to taste like a pumpkin pie got burned in the oven and that's not what I want out of this. Um, so we're just, just going to try and keep the color on the edge of brown um, and the flavor just on the edge of being roasty but not quite. In, so kind of like in a nutty territory. Um, but also hoping for some nice biscuits and caramel tones in there as well. So that's all of our grains. Uh, to our grains, we're also adding half a pound of brown sugar, which is going to bump up the ABV and also add hopefully some nice kind of caramelized sugar notes and the two pounds of pumpkin. So for hops, I'm just adding 25 IBUs of Warrior. So that's about half an ounce for me at 60 minutes. Uh, just to keep the beer balanced, that way it's not too bitter or too sweet. Uh, and that's the only purpose of the hops here. Uh, for spices, we're using one and a half tablespoons of pumpkin pie spice. So like I said, if you don't have access to pumpkin pie spice, uh, you can actually make your own with just a mixture of ginger, cinnamon, allspice, nutmeg, and cloves, if you're interested in that. It is a pretty accessible spice, I just found it in the local grocery store. For yeast, I'm just using two packages of Y-Yeast 1187 Ringwood Ale, which is an English ale strain. Um, and I'm using two packages of it instead of a starter because I'm lazy and bought my ingredients yesterday, so I had no time to make starter. Um, for water, I'm going to go for a sort of balanced profile with uh, some added hardness in there just to kind of combat the color of the beer, keep the residual alkalinity where it's supposed to be without going overboard like I did on my porter. So um, just so you are aware, uh, my water profile as it stands is relatively minerally and that's because I use my city's tap water um, to base my water profile on. So this is basically just a reference for you so that you can see how water affects the flavor of beer. Um, it may be different where you live or you may start from reverse osmosis water and build your own profile. But the important thing to make note of here, I think, is to keep your sulfates and chlorides relatively balanced. Um, if you want to, you can add a little bit extra on the chlorides to bring out the malty aspect of the beer. Um, but also to keep your bicarbonate level or your hardness level um, a little bit higher than you otherwise would just to, because the uh, darker malts can tend to lower the mash pH a little bit. Um, so you kind of want to keep that in check. So I am uh, using a water profile that is 54 parts per million of calcium, 10 parts per million of magnesium, 78 parts per million of sodium, 105 parts per million of sulfate, 123 parts per million of chloride, and 70 parts per million of bicarbonate. And I am adding 6 grams of gypsum, 2 grams of epsom, 2 grams of calcium chloride, and 2 grams of baking soda to my water to uh, attempt to achieve that profile. A couple other notes here, we are going to have to first cook the pumpkin uh, in the oven for a little while before we actually add it to the mash. Yes, uh, we are mashing with the pumpkin. But the important thing to do is to cook it in the oven. We're going to use uh, 350 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 minutes uh, for the two pounds of pumpkin. And what that is going to do is kind of bring out a little bit more of flavor from it. Hopefully it caramelizes it a little bit. Once that's complete, we'll mash in with the grains and the pumpkin. Um, and we will actually be doing a 90 minute boil for this one to kind of create some extra deepness, richness in the flavor. And uh, then we'll add, you know, we'll start off our boil addition and at 60 minutes from there. So anyway, um, normally at this point, I would say I, my water is up to temp and I'm ready to mash in, but it's not because we're cooking pumpkin. So I'll take you over to the kitchen and we'll start cooking the pumpkin.
So as you can see, it's baked pretty nicely now. It's uh, gotten most of the moisture out of it. So um, we're gonna go ahead and figure out how to add this in. I have two sheets of tin foil on here, so maybe that's not the way to do it. Oh my God, all right, hold on. Not a good idea. Don't do what I did. <laughs> all right, so after narrowly avoiding disaster, all my pumpkin is now in a bowl instead of just coming off the sheet. So let's, yeah, let's do that. So <laughs> if you're making this at home um, and you're following my methods, Put it in a bowl before you mash in with your pumpkin. And we definitely want to make sure that that is well distributed. All right, so this is uh, just a recirculation system that I use. I built it a year ago. It just helps me maintain a consistent temperature in the mash. Totally not necessary to use to brew this beer, by the way. And if you can make this beer just fine in an all grain system with three vessels or an igloo cooler or a, bro a brew in a bag system works just as well. Um, so don't fret about having this sort of thing. By the way, this is probably one of the best smelling mashes that I have had in a beer in a very, very long time. All right, so uh, our 90 minute mash is completed and uh, things are looking pretty good. Now, I didn't use rice hulls in this particular beer, um, but a lot of people have been saying that the pumpkin can tend to uh, create a rather gummy mash. So hopefully we don't end up with a stuck mash. Um, but anyway, I'm going to go ahead and start transferring into the lauder phase now. Um, so let's hope that this goes well. Um, for the sake of the video's length, I'm not going to show this on camera, but I am going to explain what I do for my process. So I will typically take uh, this kettle here, which is my current mash tun, and I will drain that into this kettle uh, up until it reaches the maximum capacity of this kettle, which is eight gallons. Now, typically that requires one sparge, and with that sparge, I'll be able to top off the volume in this kettle to eight gallons. And then at that point, we have enough liquid to start the boil with. So once I have filled this kettle and I have enough liquid, I take the bag uh, out of this kettle here, and then I turn this into the actual boil kettle. Uh, so I'll just pump the liquid from this kettle back into this kettle as we start the boil. So that's what I'm gonna go take care of right now. All right, so this is our pre-boil gravity, um, and it is a basically 13.8 bricks, which translates to about a 1055 uh, specific gravity, which is pretty much in standard beers OG. All right, so we've now hit our boil um, and we're not gonna do anything. It's a 90 minute boil. Our first hop addition isn't until 60 minutes. So I'm gonna wait around until then, about half an hour from now, and uh, I'll see you then. All right, so we're about 30 minutes into our boil now. So it's time to add the uh, bittering hop addition, this uh, half ounce of Magnum. So we are at 60 minutes. So we still have another hour left, and uh, we'll come back with about five minutes remaining in the boil to add some additional ingredients and uh, take care of some additional things pre-chill. All right, so we're about five minutes from the end of the boil now, which means it's time to add a huge amount of stuff. Um, so in this bowl is a mixture of uh, half a pound of brown sugar, about two and a half to three teaspoons of yeast nutrient, and um, also a tablespoon and a half of pumpkin pie spice. That is all going to the boil right now. And basically, especially with this sugar, you wanna be careful to add it kind of gradually if you can, because it's gonna go down to the bottom and you don't want it to caramelize and burn on the bottom of the kettle. You wanna kind of make sure you're stirring it in. It will dissolve quickly, but, but for that first couple seconds, you really do wanna make sure that it is not sticking to the bottom and it is uh, suspended. So add it gradually and stir it in gradually. All right, now we come back in five minutes. Okay, so the other thing you're gonna to wanna to do around the last five or 10 minutes of your boil involves your chilling system. So in my case, it's a plate chiller, um, but this also would apply to counterflow chillers or immersion chillers as well. Whatever surface on your chilling system is uh, touching the wort, you wanna make sure it's sanitary. And the easiest way to do that right before you're actually getting ready to cool things down is to just recirculate that boiling wort through or around whatever chilling system you have. So in my case, um, I will be circulating it through the plate chiller for the last five or so minutes of the boil. All right, so we made it through the end of our boil successfully. All right, I'm just going ahead and chilling things down now via the plate chiller here. So once this is all chilled down, I will take the uh, output from the uh, recirculation here and put it into the fermenter, uh, and then we'll pitch our yeast. All right, so uh, we have just finished cooling everything down to about at 70 degrees, which is an acceptable pitching temperature for this yeast. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and transfer over 
Uh, one of the most important things you should do, especially for high gravity beers like this one, uh, is introduce as much oxygen as possible uh, into the wort pre-fermentation. Uh, so oxygen is gonna help your yeast duplicate and grow uh, healthily, uh, and it's also gonna cut down on the amount of off flavors that could be produced as you pitch your yeast. And it's basically very important for yeast health and yeast reproduction early on. So the way that I will typically do this is to pour the wort into the fermenter from a decent height up, which causes a lot of splashing in the fermenter, which creates a lot of dissolved oxygen and bubbles appear on the surface. And that tells you that uh, you've got a decent amount of oxygen in your wort. Truth be told, I'm probably gonna actually add some extra oxygen to this though, because the gravity is so high. Uh, so we're gonna probably shake it around for a bit after I uh, pitch my yeast. Okay, so fermentation of this beer is gonna be relatively difficult, uh, mainly because it's a giant beer. Uh, it is about 1075, 1080 OG, and I only put two smack packs into it, which for all accounts and purposes, really isn't enough yeast. Um, I don't think it's necessarily going to be enough. Uh, I'm thinking my fermentation probably will get away with not having uh, off flavors, but I think it's gonna be sluggish, it's gonna be slow, it may not attenuate completely. Uh, so it's gonna have probably some issues down the road. If you're making a beer of this strength, there's really only two routes, and that is using a lot of dry yeast or using a huge starter. Uh, which I just didn't have time to put together. So um, I suppose I could co-pitch something, uh, but I'm probably not gonna do that. Uh, I think Ringwood is known for being a pretty robust fermenter, so I think we're still gonna be okay. Um, but we'll, we'll see, uh, we will see. So the idea for this fermentation is to A, pitch enough yeast, and B, uh, make sure that your fermentation temperature doesn't get out of control. So English ale yeasts like to ferment on the cooler side of things. Uh, so the best way to do this beer is probably to start around 65 to 68 degrees and then if you need to attenuate it further ramp up the temperature towards the end but you should be okay actually holding a single temperature for this fermentation. So despite Ringwood Ale being a pretty robust yeast uh, as far as this fermentation goes it's not going to be short. Uh, it is going to take a decent amount of time for all the yeast to chew through all of those sugars and to ensure that there's no off flavors left up behind. So they're gonna have a primary fermentation period, they're gonna hit their final gravity, then they're gonna spend a couple days cleaning up a whole bunch of extra flavors and compounds that get generated during that first fermentation phase. So uh, it's gonna probably be at least two weeks in the fermenter, and then we're gonna keg this. And because it's a strong beer, it's going to age pretty well. So it, it actually may not be at its best right as soon as I keg it. It might need two to three weeks to a month to really hit its stride. So depending on how it's tasting as it ages after I keg it, uh, that will dictate when I do the actual tasting portion of this video. So in the meantime, I'm gonna go ahead and pitch my yeast and put this away in a dark corner for a couple weeks. So my refractometer was giving me some wonky results for my OG, so uh, I had to resort to ye old hydrometer uh, to measure OG with, just like in the good old days. And it looks like we're sitting around, oops, we're sitting around 1073 for an OG, uh, which is pretty healthy, so um, I'll take it. All right, so this is our final gravity for the uh, pumpkin nail here. It's about 1016, uh, which is, well, it's about right. I think it's about what I've expected. It's about two weeks in the fermenter now. Um, and uh, we got it kegged up tonight and we will be aging this for a little while because the spices are a bit strong at the moment. All right, so this beer had some major spice components. And as a result, the flavor of said spices tends to be very, very strong at first. And it needs a little time usually to kind of just mellow itself out and, um, and reach a level of equilibrium that is actually tasty and not just overpowering. So here we are a month later uh, from kegging, but uh, I probably would have been fine after about two or three weeks if I hadn't made one single mistake. Uh, and that was tasting my beer about a week into fermentation and thinking it could use some more spice flavor. Uh, so I, at that point, decided that I would add about half a teaspoon of dry pumpkin spice right into the fermenter. Well, when you do something like that, adding spices in the secondary directly, um, it tends to actually really uh, quite up the level of extraction, um, and you get a very powerful kick out of that. 
uh, especially with the spices that are in pumpkin spice, they themselves are pretty strong. So as a result, I ended up with a beer that went into the keg and tasted very overpoweringly spicy. Uh, definitely way overdid it this time, and I think a lot of you guys are probably out there saying, ha, yes, I knew you would do that. It's a mistake that many of us make, uh, thinking our beer just needs flavor adjustment instead of just more time. Um, and while it's not detrimental, it just required a little bit longer for those spices to kind of uh, get through uh, their process of mellowing out. And here we are, like I said, one month later, and I think the beer has reached a point of uh, good equilibrium. So I'm gonna go ahead and pour it now for you guys, and then we'll go outside and talk about it because it's a weird 72 degree day in the middle of November. So I'm gonna take advantage of that. All right, so it's called Plastered Pilgrim. It's uh, coming in at 7.6% ABV and 24 IBUs. All right, so as you can see, the color of the beer is actually a decent medium brown. Um, it has developed a pretty good head retention, which is nice to see. And um, actually, if you put it up to the light, it's kind of like almost a brown, reddish brown kind of shade. Um, but yeah, the beer looks pretty good, pretty appetizing, um, and a nice kind of thin muddled uh, off-white head. So now, not totally clear, but that's all right, um, because it is a dark beer, and I wasn't really trying to make this super clean. All right, so now we're gonna go in for Roma. Roma is uh, pretty full of the pumpkin spices. Um, there's a decent amount of kind of like a, a fruity, not no, not really a fruity note, kind of like a, a dark fruit, like a raisin uh, kind of aroma. And I think you also get a little bit of sweetness on the aroma as well. Uh, but yeah, spices and kind of raisin. And now for mouthfeel. It's got a pretty substantial mouthfeel. Um, so it's uh, very smooth. It's not harshly carbonated or biting. Um, and uh, relatively medium full body. Uh, it's not as thick as like a Russian Imperial style, but it's up there. Um, it's got substantial body, which actually makes this really good to drink on kind of colder days. Not like this, but like I said, I want to be out here for the lighting and just the fact that it's a nice day uh, as opposed to sitting inside and being cold and miserable. It has a sort of um, surprisingly uh, smooth, creamy kind of character to the mouthfeel as well, which is actually pretty nice. Um, and it goes well with the uh, with the blend of spices and the kind of interesting malt profile that this has. Speaking of which, I'm very excited to talk about flavor, so let's go ahead and just go into that. So the spices, like I said, uh, initially were very strong, um, and they are still kind of the main highlight of this whole thing. However, at this point in time, they've really dwindled uh, to uh, not necessarily a background note, but more of a complementary and actually balanced note, um, and part of that flavor. So the spice is really the first thing that you get here. Strong amount of cinnamon and ginger. Um, I think are the prominent ones. And, uh, you're getting some nutmeg and some clove as well. I mean, they all really do come through, which is pretty cool. Um, it tastes like a dessert. It's uh, just not as sweet as, you know, like a pumpkin pie, for example. Now, other thing to note about this is I'm really not getting very much pumpkin or squash character or any of that. I'm getting more of a bready character. Um, so as far as the malt goes, you're really looking at uh, mostly like a, uh, a dark bread um, and kind of a toasty character, a little bit of a nutty character. Um, it's got a toffee note as well. Uh, nothing caramel sweet though. There's no roasted elements of this. Um, it's more along the lines of a sweeter beer anyway. Um, and I think the roast would be a little out of place. It's, uh, it's definitely quite a good combination. I think the malt character really does support the spices in a way that this actually feels like it's a, a baked treat um, of sorts. It's not exactly as sweet as a dedicated dessert beer, um, but it works. I'm also getting some fruity notes like, like a dark raisin or maybe a little bit of a fig, uh, but not quite that intense. Um, definitely more on the raisiny end. 
when this was young, definitely had a lot more fruity character. I think I might have fermented a bit warm, um, but he definitely worked. Uh, given enough time to age this thing out, it has really changed and, and it's gotten more complex. Uh, it's gotten more interesting. I think the spices are definitely the star of the show here. Um, and they're not, they're not overpowering, which is really what I was worried about. <laughs> to be fair, um, this definitely feels like a lot more of a holiday themed ale uh, than it does a fall themed ale. Um, given its strength and given its spice complexity, it, is, it seems a bit more like a winter warmer, um, which is great. Uh, I do actually think that this is going to be a beer that sticks around for a while, and um, it's only going to get better as it ages. Um, all the good characteristics of a strong brown ale are in here. Um, it is very flavorful, it's very complex, really kind of a joy to drink the base beer on this, and the spices add a different level of complexity that's, that's really nice. Um, this can't get any pumpkin character out of this, and I don't know if I would want to. It's not a flavor that I really see doing very well with beer in, um, to be honest, not one that I've particularly enjoyed myself. Um, so I'm thankful it's not here in, in force, uh, but if that is your thing and something that you want in your beer, I would recommend doubling the quantity of pumpkin that I gave you in this recipe if you just decide to make this beer itself. So overall, I definitely think the beer was a success. Uh, it was kind of a fun off-the-cuff kind of brew where I just came up with a recipe that worked out pretty well. And, um, you know, it wasn't necessarily bound to a specific style like I normally do. So I definitely had fun making this, and I think the product that came out of it was decent. Um, you know, it's not a showstopper beer, but it's definitely not bad. So once again, just to recap, I think uh, if you want to make a beer similar to this, uh, I recommend going ahead and if you want more pumpkin, double the addition of pumpkin that I had earlier in the recipe and also uh, cut the spices back <laughs> compared to what I did here. Just stick with what is in the recipe for the spices. Don't add an impromptu quarter teaspoon of dry spices into the uh, secondary. Just don't do that unless you want to blow your palate off in the first couple weeks. Anyway, in the meantime, I'm, I apologize for having taken so long to uh, upload a new video. Uh, as I mentioned in the end of my last one, there's been a lot of stuff going on in my life right now uh, that has made it difficult to keep up to pace with the brewing videos, but uh, after taking a temporary break, they will be back to uploading regularly. Uh, so as of now, this video will probably be kind of on its own for a bit, but after a couple weeks, they will start flowing back in as I start brewing again. I do have one rather important announcement for the channel, uh, and that is starting on the next video after this one, there is going to be a fun surprise in terms of equipment uh, and something that I think is going to be welcome for a lot of people and something that is going to be uh, something that is going to make it easier for everybody to actually brew the beer that I make and have it be similar. Uh, so I'm hoping to be able to start uh, making some changes to the brewing process and the brewing equipment that I use in order to make it much easier for those of you who wish to brew these recipes exactly as I make them and to see how things turn out for yourself. So stay tuned to see what that is exactly. And uh, that, once again, will be happening in the next video after this one. So hey, if you like this stuff, hit that like button. Uh, it means a lot to me, helps this channel out quite a bit. And if you wanna see this stuff regularly, hit that subscribe button. You'll see me kick out a new grain to glass video roughly every two to three weeks. And uh, if you don't really wanna hang on and wait around that long, I do have an Instagram and a Patreon where there's additional content for you on a more frequent basis. The Instagram is at the apartment brewer and Patreon is linked here in the corner if you wanna go check that out. You wanna talk about the beer, you wanna talk about any aspect of the brewing process, why pumpkin beers suck, why they're amazing, I don't care, just wanna talk about it, hit me up in the comment section down below. I do read every single comment and uh, I will do my best to respond to as many of them as I can in a timely manner. Last but not least, in the description box down below, there's two things. First of all, there is the recipe for this beer, exactly the way that I brewed it on my system. There may be some differences from system to system, so just keep that in mind. If you want to make this beer, uh, you may have to make some tweaks for your own system. But the recipe, as I made it in this video, is down there. Also down below the recipe, there is a complete list of all of my home brewing equipment and links to Amazon or other stores where you might be able to purchase them if you wish to. Just be advised that it does end up uh, making me a small commission, but it's at no additional cost to you and it's a good uh, source of income for this channel. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and finish off the rest of this beer and I'll catch you guys in the next one. So until then, cheers.